Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we take a look at the status of three significant beef export markets in Asia. Plus, how one Texas feed yard is managing bovine respiratory disease. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. Topping this week's cattle industry news, according to a midsummer report, industry experts say there's no evidence of herd expansion and that the U.S. cow herd is actually continuing to decline. Indications point to a 1.5 to 2% decline in beef cow inventory for 2011. Industry analysts also anticipate a 5 to 6% decline in the total number of replacement heifers compared to just one year ago. Experts say there are multiple factors contributing to the decline, including the severe drought, making it difficult for cattlemen to feed the animals they already have, as well as overall uncertainty in the marketplace due to the current political and regulatory climates. We have more information about the 2011 cow herd inventory in this week's Market Watch. Market Watch. And here, here in the studio to talk more about some of the factors contributing to the shrinking cow herd is Mike Miller, Chief Operating Officer with Cattlefax. Mike, thanks for coming to the show again. Thank you. You know, we just recently received that 2011 uh, mid-year report from USDA about the cow herd. Tell us what it should say to us as beef cattle producers. Well, I think the, the, the trends kind of came in as expected. I think most people anticipated that a lot of the beef cow inventory numbers would be down from a year ago, and that's exactly what the report showed. If you want to pick out a number in general, most classes of cattle, beef cattle, were down about 1% compared to the same time a year ago. So, you know, the trends that we've talked about for the last several years as it relates to the beef cow herd, it's shrinking, you know, all the different factors that are affecting uh, the, the economic conditions as well as, uh, you know, some of the conditions in the country are, are certainly still in play. And so, uh, you know, for the most part, down about 1%. The, you know, the, one of the numbers that maybe stuck out a little bit is the, the beef replacement number, beef heifer replacement number was down a little more significantly than most would have thought. So again, uh, illustrating that, that we're not quite ready to expand the, the nation's cow herd just yet. I was going to ask you about that. Clearly, uh, you know, earlier this year we talked about this maybe being the year that we started to rebuild that cow herd. How big an impact is the drought having on those decisions? Oh, it's just, it, it's so significant. I mean, it's just a, a, a absolute critical condition down there. Uh, and, and really the way that you look at this and the way that you, an, you can analyze this a lot of different ways, but you know, if we're dry in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and through the southeastern part of the United States, it's just really difficult to get any legs under any kind of an expansion. So you know, I think for the next couple of years, based on what we've seen this last year, we're going to be talking about restocking, not really expansion down there for a couple of years. And, and our hope is, is that we're going to get some relief here this fall, but uh, it's going to take quite a little bit of time to get that country healed back up. Yeah. If I read the report correctly, there were some real notable differences, though, between the beef numbers versus the dairy numbers. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the, you know, the dairy guys have been profitable now for a while, and so most of their numbers, most of their indicators are that they're growing. And, uh, you know, it makes an awful lot of sense. The dairy industry is very quick to respond to uh, solid economics, and their, their conditions have been pretty good now for a period of time. So they're going to expand, uh, it looks like here, for, for at least the next uh, 6 to 12 months as the beef industry, uh, you know, probably uh, shrinks just a little bit more. So I think, you know, the, the economic conditions, the, the, the beef guys are, are, are certainly in a position to make some money. We just have to get some relief from Mother Nature, and then I think we'll be well on our way. So look forward the next couple of years and tell us what these numbers and these statistics should be saying to those of us in the beef cattle industry. Well, I think as we mentioned earlier, you know, we came into 2011 hoping that this was going to be the year that we start to see some stabilization in the cow herd and hopefully see some growth. And it looks like based on everything that's gone on with the drought, it's, it's probably going to be another year of, of taking a step back in terms of total beef numbers. Um, now what that means to producers and prices is that inventory supplies are still going to be down for at least the next two to three, maybe even four years. Uh, and prices should certainly benefit because of those that, that drawdown in overall supply. So, you know, I think it's a, 
uh, a combination of factors that suggest that, that prices are going to be well supported at the kind of levels that we've seen the last couple of years, if not even higher. So I think from a pricing standpoint, it bodes very well. Uh, we've got a lot of these supply and demand factors that we're going to have to watch pretty closely because we're, we're, we're drawing down that overall supply of beef that we can show to the U.S. consumer, and, and there's, there's some concern there. So, but I think producers generally are, are going to like these trends and, and certainly like the prices that are, that are going to be coming their way. Mike, as always, thank you so much for your insight. Thanks for having me, Kevin. For more information and expert analysis, visit cattlefacts.com. Another area of concern for cattlemen these days is trade and the efforts being made to open up foreign markets. We have more on this issue in this week's Cattlemen's Capital Concerns. So there's three trade agreements we're working on, Korea, Colombia, and Panama. And they're all critical. I mean, you know, every part of agriculture kind of you wonder is this really going to help or not with each of these but but overall we need to encourage trade we need to encourage the export of our products I mean, there's no question we have the best beef in the world and so we need to again open up our borders so we get our product uh, outside of America and I think that's going to help keep the prices high I think we have to continue to uh, let uh, the USDA know and the secretary uh, of the facts, and the facts are, are, are clear. Uh, American uh, beef producers at all levels uh, are the best in the world, in my opinion, and they have stiff competition uh, in other parts of the world, and they compete in foreign markets, and where there's fair trade, uh, i.e. A, a level playing field, and we know that's not always the case in Japan or in South Korea, although we're hoping that we can get this South Korean trade uh, agreement to pass. But uh, when it is a, f a level playing field, our American uh, beef producers can compete with any uh, because they produce the, the best quality at the most cost-effective level. Panama, Colombia, and Korea. Now, there's a great opportunity for our, our export market for livestock, particularly Korea right now. And so we're doing everything we can to open that fr uh, free trade agreement up. It will mean uh, huge amounts of money for my farmers and ranchers. Oh, it's, it's, we have a wonderful opportunity right now to pass these three trade agreements with South Korea and Panama and Colombia that mean jobs, but they also mean huge exports for American agriculture. So it's been a little frustrating for me why we aren't going ahead and passing these, getting these passed, especially as we see other countries coming in and they're filling the gap and they're going to, to uh, take advantage of the agreements with these countries if we don't go ahead and pass these. So it seems like the president continues to put new uh, requirements uh, forth that we have to pass this before he will give us the language and let us vote on it. And I think that's wrong. We need to get these passed. We need to get this done. And it's going to be positive for the, the cattlemen and, and the farmers out there once we can get them passed. Stand up and have your voice heard on important issues just like this one. Contact your members of Congress by visiting Beef usa.org. Then click on Government Affairs and get involved now. Speaking of Beef USA, if you haven't logged on in a while, you might notice that the website looks a little bit different than it used to. Beef USA has a new look with easier navigation to some of your favorite NCBA programs, including Beltway Beef, the 2012 Cattle Industry Annual Convention and NCBA Trade Show, and of course, NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. So be sure and check out the new and improved BeefUSA.org. Ahead on NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. I think number one is in China. We had very good meetings with the Chinese officials. Uh, I think we understand their position, they understand our position, and I think the, 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 the most important thing I think with China is the fact that we gotta move on China now. We take an in-depth look at the beef export markets in China, Taiwan, and Japan. Plus, we visit an operation in Texas to learn more about managing bovine respiratory disease. We'll be right back. You're watching NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman on RFD-TV. 
You're not responsible for the weather, just the cattle. And Rangeland works as hard as you do to deliver performance, production, and profitability. Cattle need consistent nutrition. They'll get it year-round with Rangeland products from Lando Lakes. Deliver what they need free choice in weather-resistant loose minerals and mineral and protein tubs. Get the most out of your forage. See your Lando Lakes co-op for products that will stand up to whatever Mother Nature throws at us. Weather's coming in. Rangeland. Consider it done. Tough trailers built for tough country. Big Ben Trailers manufactures a different kind of trailer. One that's built to put up with the rough conditions found on the ranch. Rugged built using heavy gauge powder coated steel and a 2x4 rectangle tube frame. There's a 1 inch gap between the side and floor so there's no place for water or manure to accumulate and rust. Big Ben Trailers are loaded with standard features. A lever action hitch, a three foot escape gate and a middle sorting gate. Rhino lining along the front edges and a receiver hitch to tow another trailer, chute or other equipment. Tough and practical. That's Big Ben Trailers. Designed and built by a working cattleman. You can rely on and trust Big Ben Trailers for their durability and convenient features. Reasonably priced for any rancher to afford. For a list of dealers and other design features, visit BigBenTrailers.com. Big Ben Trailers. Built cattlemen tough. John Deere K-Series Loaders. You asked for a machine beefy enough to handle your harsh work environment. And John Deere delivered. Axle coolers, reversing fans, and a dual hydraulic differential lock keep your machine productive for years to come. And with dozens of options, this loader is king of the cattle business. Your dealer can spec a K-Series loader that's just right for you. See your dealer today. Increasing the demand for U.S. beef around the globe is a key priority of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And recently, a group of industry leaders had the opportunity to travel to Asia to learn more about the markets and the future of U.S. beef trade. Let's head to Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Mike Deering, who's learning more. Hi, Mike. Thanks, Kevin. I'm here in Washington, D.C. with leaders from the U.S. beef industry who just got back from a trade mission in Asia. They're here to share their insights from that journey. I'm joined today by Bill Westman, Vice President of International Trade for the American Meat Institute, CEO of the National Meat Association, Barry Carpenter, CEO of the U.S. Meat Export Federation, Phil Sang, and Forrest Roberts, CEO of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. To start this off, I'm going to turn to Forrest and ask you just to tell us what this is all about and what you're doing here in Washington, D.C. Well, this week here in Washington, D.C., we're following up with uh, the United States Trade Representative's Office and other uh, key government officials within USDA to really give them the outcomes and the learnings of what we brought back from our recent trip to Asia. Our focus in Asia was around three countries, China, Taiwan, followed by Japan. And within our focus there, it was about how do we understand what are the issues facing those three countries and the large opportunity that we have in all of these key Asian markets for U.S. beef and understanding what are the real issues and more importantly, how do we come back to the U.S. and look at ways that we can implement solutions to fix these problems. It was an opportunity to develop relationships and it was an opportunity to have a collaborative relationship with all four of our organizations in representing the U.S. beef supply chain. So why is that important? It's very important for producers in the United States to understand the value that is there. It's incremental value for producers that it can range anywhere from $150 to $200 a head when we talk about the value of these critical export markets. So that was a little bit of why we were there, what we were doing, and what we're trying to follow up with here currently this week. From a high level, Phil, can you give us an overview or a recap of your trip? Well, I think number one is we want to afford the CEOs here, the leaders of the industry, an opportunity to see the markets directly and from the perspective of the markets as opposed to from maybe the perspective from the U.S. So what we did was we arranged meetings with health officials, we arranged meetings with government officials, with trade, with industry, uh, so everyone could have a good opportunity to see and, and understand the issues that, that we confront in these markets. I think number one is in China, we had very good meetings with the Chinese officials. 
Uh, I think we understand their position, they understand our position, and I think the, 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 the most important thing I think with China is the fact that we got to move on China now. I think with Taiwan we had the same kinds of meetings with government and trade. And also in Japan, there were very, very good meetings also with the Japanese as far as the trade, the industry, and, and, and taking a look at what it's going to take to move beyond that 20-month threshold that we've been stymied with for so long. Now, Barry, according to the U.S. International Trade Commission, um, China's potential of ex all ag exports would be in the neighborhood of $3.9 to $5.2 billion dollars. And, and when we talk about China, what does that mean for U.S. beef? Well, it's tremendous for U.S. beef. Uh, we see an immediate jump of $200 million worth of sales into China. Uh, and that would just be the starting point. As the standard of living continues to increase in China, the demand for high-quality proteins like U.S. beef will continue to grow exponentially. So we're very optimistic and we're very anxious for these trade access issues to go away. Now, China is undoubtedly a very complicated market. Um, since 2003, the doors have been closed, but China's official policy is that they're open to U.S. beef. Bill, can you explain the story with China? Yes, that's true. China has stated that the market is open for U.S. beef. The problem is they have put on 22 conditions, which we're not, our industry is not able to meet or not, is not commercially viable. For example, they have certain product restrictions on offalls, which we cannot meet, and they have put a traceability requirement on our cattle, which we're not able to meet. So the U.S. government was in China in January to try to negotiate some of these items, but they were not successful. The, there was a stalemate in the negotiations, and we've asked them to go back and handle some of these technical issues as soon as possible so that we can get this market back open. Now, Forrest, as CEO of the national, the largest national cattlemen's organization, what is NCBA doing to help move beef into China and get those restrictions lifted, so to speak? Well, China is no doubt, as has already been stated, a very high priority for all four organizations, not just NCBA. And within that, that's what our government affairs team here in Washington, D.C. is doing every day. They're burning boot leather, as, as the old saying goes, on Capitol Hill every day and working with organizations and, and agencies like the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, uh, USDA, in trying to provide solutions to these technical issues that have been referenced by Bill here just a few seconds ago. And so that is our focus. We maintain that focus each and every day. And the only way we're going to be successful is being very collaborative in our discussions and how we carry out these solutions with these three organizations. And that's why we went to China together. Let's take that same question to you, Phil. What's USMEF, the U.S. Meat Export Federation, doing to get these restrictions lifted? Well, I think number one is we work very closely with the Ag Affairs Office and the U.S. Embassy. I think one of the key things that we work on is trying to find and, and gather the most incisive information about what's going on in the market every day as it unfoils. So uh, I think one of the key things we do is report this information back to our industry partners, report it back to the USDA, so it will afford them an opportunity to deal with ground level information to go forward and, and uh, be as impactful as they can in these negotiations. Thank you, gentlemen. And when we come back, we're going to turn our focus to Taiwan. These days, more cattlemen choose Draxon to fight BRD than any other brand. Here's why. It works. We have uh, fewer uh, repulls, and the ones that we do repull respond, and we have fewer chronics in the end. To retreat anything is. It's a lot more expensive than using Draxon as the first time. And the evidence backs up what most cattlemen already know. Draxon cuts retreats by 50%. So talk to your veterinarian and check the online calculator at Draxon.com. You'll see why Draxon should be your first choice to fight BRD. Basically what it's allowed us to do with our operation is run more cattle through in a given period of time. It's just really been a good, good product to use. Do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Draxon has a pre-slaughter withdrawal time of 18 days. Please visit Draxon.com or call 1-888-DRAXON for more information. Consumers count on America's cattlemen to deliver quality beef every time. So in your daily work to raise cattle, keep quality top of mind in everything you do, in the care, feeding, and handling of your animals. You can be a part of a national program that provides sound, proven guidelines for beef cattle production that will establish you as a leader and responsible stockman. 
Beef Quality Assurance, or BQA, is a national program funded by the Beef Checkoff that can help you strengthen your operation, improve cattle care, drive more value to the bottom line, and increase consumer confidence in the quality of America's beef. Producers across the nation have embraced the BQA program because of their commitment to be the world's best producers of beef and because assuring beef quality is our job, not someone else's. Find out how you can become BQA certified. Visit the website bqa.org. Welcome back to this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm talking about Asian beef trade with U.S. beef industry leaders, and now we're turning our focus to Taiwan. Forrest, let's start with you. What were some market challenges that you saw in Taiwan? Well, Taiwan is a very interesting market. It's by all standards, when you look at the numbers, it's a market that's been growing. If we go back to 2003, when our markets were closed, even in Taiwan. But one of the major issues that was front row center in every discussion in Taiwan is the action that that country took in January of 2011. It was action that they took in basically implementing some regulations that were on their books that would prohibit the use of ractopamine. Ractopamine, as some people would know, is the feed additive that is used in beef production. Uh, it's a feed additive that is extremely safe. It is a technology that I would have some personal experience with in a previous career, and I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, it's a very safe technology that's used in the U.S. beef industry. However, what we see now is an issue that's being debated not about the scientific validity, validity of that technology, but rather really the political implications of what's happening in their country. There's a lot of changes going on in Taiwan now politically. There's a presidential election coming up in uh, January of 2012, and that seems to have overshadowed any discussions that are of the scientific merits of this product being used. So currently, that is our barrier and our largest barrier within the country of Taiwan. Now, Phil, how have these challenges affected U.S. beef sales into this market? Well, it's been very impactful. I think number one is Taiwan. After the opening of their market in 2007, they were the largest market in Asia until last year as far as beef exports. So it was a very important market to us and also a market where actually on science and a lot of these things, they were leading the way, as, as we well know. Uh, this year, compared to last year, it's one of the few markets that's actually down. We're down 5% through May in Taiwan as far as our beef exports. So the impact of this has been very strong. We also think that going forward, it's going to be even more strict because of the, the situation and the and the, the basically the way they're addressing this as we go forward. So it's becoming very, very difficult for the importers to import the product. So it's getting more stringent and we have to do something to, to correct this as soon as possible. Now, Barry, let's get back to this issue of ractopamine. I understand that Codex recently had a meeting where they considered establishing guidelines for ractopamine in livestock feed. Can you explain, first of all, what is Codex and then what the outcome was of that meeting? Okay, yeah. The Codex is an international body, a scientific body, that evaluates animal health products. They do that in a way that they have a scientific team that evaluates the risk assessment programs. They look at the, the attributes of the products, and then they establish limits that they recommend that countries use for, for both export and, and import and their domestic use. So it's really a, a, a governing body that's a voluntary body that is trying to bring standardization to that element in the marketplace internationally. Uh, the ramifications of what happened at the last meeting are disappointing to us. Uh, this is the third time that the body has looked at ractopamine to approve it. It has passed now three times their scientific committee. Uh, it has no issues are being held back from a scientific perspective. But there are other issues that countries are not willing to step forward and come up with a consensus that this is a drug that they want to go ahead and bless and give an MRL. So what that means is we're, we're back to the drawing board. We'll be looking at another year of preparing ourselves and going back to Codex again to try to get this particular animal health product moved through the system. Now, Bill, Barry says we're back to the drawing board. What are the next steps as you see it? Well, we, we, the industry, we feel very strongly that the codex process is very important and we need to continue to engage within the codex system 
as the body that creates standards for international trade. And it's not just important for us, but it's important for other markets, important for smaller countries that don't have the ability to conduct risk assessments, and they will turn to an international body like Codex to use these maximum residue levels that are recommended as their standards for imports. So it becomes very important for our trade, and we're looking to work with the Codex through the next year. Secondly, we plan to work bilaterally with other countries that may be able to look at establishing an import MRL or maximum residue level as a precursor to establishing a national standard. So that's what we plan to do. All right, well, thank you for your comments here, gentlemen. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Japan. When respiratory diseases hit the herd, it doesn't take long before your calves are drowning in complications, unless you have them prepared. Get them ready with Pyramid 5 plus Prespons SQ. This one easy vaccine will protect your herd from a range of ailments. Hey, there is plenty of fresh air out here. Make sure your calves get their fill. Go on now. Take care of your cattle, and they'll take care of you. Fierce acceleration. The Gator XUV 825i will shatter your expectations. NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. It's a television show by cattlemen for cattlemen. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks for joining us. Each week, join host Kevin Oxner for the latest in beef cattle news, market analysis, and producer education. Cattlemen won't want to miss an episode. Debuting Tuesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on RFD-TV or anytime at cattlemen to cattlemen.org. Quality matters to me because I love my family. I want to raise my family here like generations before me. My family has always worked together and played together. We have always laughed together and cried together. My family is my life. Careful stewardship of the animals and resources that are under my care benefits my family. They live where I work and eat the same food that I produce. I'm proud of what we'll do here today. Welcome back. I'm here in Washington, D.C., talking Asian beef trade with U.S. beef industry leaders. Right now, we're, our focus is on Japan. Now, Phil, Japan was once a top market for U.S. beef. Today, that's not the case. Well, yes, Japan, prior to the advent of BSC, was our, our leading market, our leading, leading premium market. Uh, today, uh, we've, uh, like Japan, like so many other countries around the world, closed its market immediately as a result of the BSC, and we've been working very assiduously trying to get back into this market in a meaningful way ever since 2003. Uh, but there's tremendous demand in the Japanese market. There's demand that's still been unmet. Uh, the Australians worked very aggressively in Japan, especially in North Asia, with their safe and clean campaign right after the, the advent of BSC. And so we've been clawing our way back. We're, this just through uh, January through May of this year, we're up 66%. But again, I remind you that there's about uh, 200,000 metric tons of beef the Aussies were never able to make up. And so we we think that uh, that's an that's a area that uh, the United States, once we have further access, that's, that's right there to be picked for. So it's a very big opportunity for the United States and Japan still. Now the biggest trade barrier that we've been discussing is this issue of age restrictions. And right now Japan is only accepting beef from cattle at 20 months and young, younger. What's the chances that that will change, Barry? I think they're very good. I, I think there's, there's a strong indication coming from our visits in Japan that they're ready to start talking, they're ready to start looking to be more consistent with the OIE standards for beef trade. They have themselves made progress in controlling BSC in their country, which is going to be helpful to us if we start negotiating with them. There's great opportunities there to, to move on a step-by-step -step basis. They, they certainly are not ready to, to go to the full OIE and accept all cattle, all ages, but to get to 30 months, which will really be a major step for us as far as availability of product. I think they're close and I think that uh, we need to get our negotiators over there and start talking. Now Bill, besides this issue of 
age restrictions, what other issues or trade barriers are we facing in Japan? Well, we're faced with some pretty high tariffs on U.S. beef going to Japan, now at 38.5 percent. As well, they have some safeguard mechanisms in place that once the import level gets to a certain point, it jumps another 17 percent. So we'd certainly be interested in seeing those tariffs come down you know, for, for the Japanese consumer who likes our product, wants our product, and it would, this would make it more affordable. In addition, we have some commercial issues uh, where they uh, construe them as food safety issues, but things like labeling or mislabeling, this to us is a commercial issue and something that we should be able to negotiate with them. Now, Forrest, we've heard reports that Japan is interested in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, what are your thoughts on that? What are NCBA's thoughts on that? We think it's a great opportunity, and we welcome that opportunity for Japan to join those discussions through the TPP. We think it's an opportunity to address straight up some of the issues that both Phil and Barry were just speaking to as it relates to age restriction. And we think it would be the opportunity for us to take that next incremental step, and that's a core expectation that we have of Japan coming into those discussions, is that we feel the opportunity to go from 20 months to 30 months and capture that incremental value is justified as a means for joining these discussions. And if you boil all of it down to this, Japan is, near term, the greatest opportunity within all three of these Asian markets, and that is simply going from 20 to 30 months, and we think TPP is a great opportunity to start that process. Okay, now before we go, I want to get your final thoughts on the trade mission to Asia. Bill, let's start with you, and we'll go on down the line. Well, certainly there are tremendous opportunities in all of these North Asia markets. In China, with rapid economic growth over 30 years, a rapidly expanding middle class with disposable income, we see this as a great opportunity for our livestock producers and our U.S. beef exporters. Well, clearly it's an international market for beef trade. We're competing with many other countries for access to a lot of countries that are deficit in beef production. We need to be there. We need to have the access issues resolved so we can compete with all the other countries on a very level playing field. I think uh, just when we look at North Asia, it's just as Bill said, it's an area of tremendous opportunity. Just for the first five months of this year, U.S. exports are up 28 percent in volume, 44 percent in value. Uh, we see this growing. It can be enhanced because we're probably still leaving about a billion dollars on the table and because we don't have meaningful access in a lot of these markets. So the opportunity is immense if we can get back in these markets in a meaningful way. Mike, I would say it's an opportunity of a lifetime. When you think about what's happened in the U.S. beef industry and all the volatility and all of the profitability challenges that our industry faces, this is an opportunity that some refer to as a tax stimulus, if you will, or a stimulus package for U.S. beef producers. It's an opportunity to put an additional $150 to up to $200 a head back into the industry that is above and beyond where we are today. So that's huge. That's real, and those are real dollars. So our opportunity is to work together in a very collaborative way throughout the entire beef supply chain. And our ask of everyone out there tonight watching this program is to get engaged, just like we are engaged together. Get engaged with your state cattlemen's associations. Get engaged with NCBA and join us as we go to the Hill and make sure that members of Congress and other federal agencies know what these issues are about, how important they are to you, and what it means to your bottom line. That's what we ask of you. Well, I want to thank each of you for taking the time to share insights from this very exciting journey and the potentials for trade um, in these overseas markets. Well, with that, Kevin, I send it back to you in the Mile High City. Thanks so much for your good work moderating that discussion, Mike. It is great to have you on the show. Now, you can follow updates on U.S. beef trade by following Beltway Beef on Facebook and Twitter. You can also get more information at cattlemantocattlemen.org. We'll be right back. Comprehensive, practical, powerful. Now's the time to put the power of DNA to work in your herd with the comprehensive Igenity Profile. The inside information from Igenity can help you make more confident replacement heifer and herd sire selection decisions, add marketability to your feeder cattle, make faster genetic progress, and more. The best time to get started is when you're already working cattle during branding, weaning, or bull soundness exams. Get started today. Visit Igenity.com or call 1-877-IGENITY to put the power of DNA to work in your herd. 
Hi, I'm Kevin Auctioner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen and Colorado Rancher. Join me each week as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association brings you the latest updates in industry information and market news. Plus, each week we provide important educational information and features on cattlemen from across the country just like you. And we can't forget our favorite cowboy poet, Paxter Black. Join me for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, debuting Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern, right here on RFD TV. I am an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because I support the U.S. cattle industry, and I think it's important to support our U.S. cattle producers. In today's environment, we need all the support we can get in Washington, D.C. Collectively, we can have the beef industry's voice be heard. I'm an NCBA member. Join me today. Welcome back. Bovine respiratory disease, or BRD, costs the cattle industry millions of dollars each year. And it's a problem that many have found manageable with the right production practices. Recently, reporter Dave Russell had a chance to visit with a general manager of a feed yard in Gonzales, Texas, to learn more about how they combat this disease. At Graham Landon Cattle, General Manager Jay Gray spends his days both looking after the cattle and looking for ways to improve his operation. One issue Gray is tackling, shipping fever, or BRD. It's a common disease among cattle who are put in close quarters and are under a lot of stress, something Gray sees regularly. Well, those are, those are cattle that, that, that have been here several days. Uh, we, we've had cattle from this operation before so they're they're put in again one of those specialty environments where the current weather or the, the, the past recent weather two weeks or so not only on the cattle where they resided which i knew where they came from or we know where they come from but the cattle were put in here and, and then we had we've had several days of, of inclement weather that's not going to be uh, you know very helpful in, in getting them on their feed and and nutritionally going. Gray, looking to help these type of high-stress cattle, turned to his local representative from Intervet Shearing Plow Animal Health for ideas. The solution? A new product called ResFloor Gold, which was used to treat these high-stress cattle. It's a brand new antibiotic. Uh, it's a floor and phenicol, basically the active ingredient in new floor, um, is the base antibiotic agent of the product. Covers the three major BRD pathogens from uh, Manheimia hemolytica, Pastorella motositis, and Haemophilus somni. Well, I think people need to know that Red's Floor is a new technology, uh, combining the best of both worlds from an antibiotic standpoint to also a, a non steroidal anti inflammatory um, drug with one dose. The key things about Red's Floor is, is it's very fast acting. Uh, once we give that injection, Within 30 minutes to an hour, we have therapeutic levels in the serum, in the blood, to be effective against uh, the three major BRD pathogens. The other benefit of it, of course, is the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Makes the animal feel better, where he's up moving around, eating, drinking again, uh, doing the things that animals are supposed to do in a feed yard. And that's exactly the experience Gray saw when administering Res4 Gold to that group of high-stress cattle. About five hours after the product was administered, Gray saw a marked difference in the animals, their overall disposition, appearance, and willingness to eat and drink. We used some of this product earlier on, uh, uh, initially, in some small test cases uh, around the feed yard here. And uh, today, we haven't had any problems with those cattle, and we haven't had any follow-up treatments. Uh, those cattle have gotten time with what what we want them to do here and, and have gone on into their productive systems. Research shows that early treatment of BRD with a fast-acting, broad-spectrum antibiotic and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like Res4 Gold is key to fighting the disease. So basically what Intervet Sharing Plow did was put these two products in one convenient package where you can give a 6 ml per hundred sub-Q injection and cover all of your major BRD pathogens, make the cattle feel better. Basically, just like us, when we go to the doctor and we're sick, they give us antibiotics. Well, we take the antibiotics for five to seven days. 
but we also, first thing I do is go to the medicine cabinet and reach for the Tylenol or the Motrin to make us feel better, and that's what this product does. We've seen where cattle within four hours of treatment are up back at the bunk, putting their head in the water trough, eating, which we all know that that's part of the process to get these cattle back on their feet and performing and uh, feeling better and doing what, they're, what they need to do. And in these tough economic times, both Jay Gray and Jay Free say they know it's important not to take shortcuts. You know, we have to, number one, do the best thing for the animal, uh, treat it the most humanely and, the, and use the best animal husbandry practices that we can. And that includes making that animal feel better, making that animal more comfortable. You know, what's the cost on that? Um, you know, my, my philosophy is if we don't do these things up front, to treat the animal right, they might never make it through the feeding period and our mortality rates are gonna be higher and those cattle might not even end up in a closeout. Why we're using antibiotics like Rest4 Gold and, and there's, there's, why do we use any antibiotics? Obviously we're trying to, to, to make this animal a better, better product for us getting, getting well and over this problem just like us as people. And, and you go see the doctor, you're gonna get the best technology that's out there. That's what you expect, uh, that's what you want because you wanna feel better. So we wanna provide those cattle with the best technology that's there. And with all the challenges facing the cattle industry these days, it's good to have choices when it comes to caring for your cattle. I think ResFloor is definitely a product that will fit into everybody's toolbox. Um, you know, different people have different preferences in, in what they use, but I think ResFloor really plays a, a key role in the feed yard setting, especially uh, uh, with an, you know, having an antibiotic that gets there very quickly. We reach therapeutic levels within about 30 minutes to an hour after giving that uh, injection. So something that's going to really work fast, get in there and make the animals feel better and start uh, reducing the bacteria that are in the lungs uh, very rapidly. Reporting from Gonzales, Texas, I'm Dave Russell for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. For more information on Restfloor Gold and the folks at Merck Animal Health, visit cattlemantocattlemen.org. Stay with us, Baxter Black is up next. Your feedlot is a pack on the pounds enterprise where your goal is to get the animals to market fast. Every minute counts as you battle the weather, livestock genetics, and health issues. Now there's a powerful new dual action therapy for the hospital pen that shares your need for fast action. Rest Floor Gold. Ask your veterinarian about Rest Floor Gold. See improvement in as few as six hours with Rest Floor Gold. You take pride in the beef you raise. Countless hours invested to assure a safe and wholesome calf crop. Why trust that calf crop to just anyone? Experience the new Dinklage difference with a long history and reputation for outstanding performance and cattle care. We use a combination of cutting edge technologies and data driven decision making to establish our place as leaders in the cattle feeding industry. Allow Dinklage to be a part of your team in the quest to maximize your profits. With five locations to serve you in Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado. For more information on the new Dinklage difference, stop by one of our yards or visit us on the web at DinklageFeedYards.com. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. Sometimes you feel like a block, and sometimes you don't. That's why Sweet Licks gives you a choice. In the bag, in the block, or in the tub, and Sweet Licks offers a complete line of vitamin, mineral, protein, and medicated nutritional supplements in the form you want to satisfy even the most discriminating domestic livestock, even the gourmet goat or the finicky fowl or the connoisseur cow. For information, 187 Sweet Licks. Profitability never tasted so sweet. If a cowboy herds a herd of cattle, we call him a herder. And if a sheep man herds a flock of sheep, He's still a herder, but why isn't he called a flocker? 
Ole has always referred to himself as a cow disturber. And I think that's an accurate description of what cowboys do. The definition of disturb is to annoy or molest. Where are you going, Bill? Oh, I'm going to go out and check the cows. Which really means I'm going to ride into the bunch, get them all up, turn them around, and generally annoy and disturb them. Now, I grant there are occasions when we have certain definite tasks in mind, like I'm going to bring in that cow with the arrow in her side. But most of the time, we're just disturbing them. If we're honest with ourselves, our language would be more forthright. The cattle foreman in the feedlot would give his instructions like this. Jason, I want you to enter that first pen in the north alley, unsettle the steers by sitting quietly for a moment, then upset them by approaching, confuse them by weaving back and forth, agitating and molesting them constantly, and badger each one until you've gotten them all up and milled around. And once you're convinced that you've stirred them up sufficiently, you may go and disturb the next pen. Or the cowman might say to his wife, Darling, I'm at the board meeting, and I'd like you to torment that heifer we got in the barn lot oh, every 20 minutes. She's trying to calve, peek over the fence and disturb her, shine the light in her eyes to break her concentration, worry her as often as needed, and when I get back, I'll slip in and frighten her into calving. Well, in fairness, we're doing what all good shepherds do. We watch over our flocks because that is our calling. We stand guard in case any should need our help. But if truth in labeling is ever applied to our job descriptions, we'll have to be more specific about what we do. So maybe the next time somebody asks you what it is you do, try one of these on for size. Oh, I'm a herd rearranger or a bull nudger. Maybe a sheep panicker, mule cusser, equine perplexer, steer beautician, hog motivator, Holstein therapist, cow companion, dog shouter, or cowboy confabulator. That would be me. And I'm Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the premier cattle industry organization representing your best interests in Washington, D.C. and across the country. I want to have my voice heard, and this is the strongest way I can speak it, is through NCBA. And my little voice gets, gets a lot of magnitude with this group. Well, I've been an NCBA member for a long time. I, my, uh, my family thoroughly believes in giving back to the industry that they make a living from. And, you know, I've carried that on from generation to generation, and this is the organization of choice for the beef industry. Every day, NCBA works to represent you on issues including trade, taxes, food safety and nutrition, animal welfare, and the environment. The main reason I'm an NCBA member is to become engaged and more, and more knowledgeable about everything that's going on in the beef industry. It's easy to join NCBA. Just visit BeefUSA.org or call us at 1-866-USA-BEEF. Quality matters to me because I'm responsible for the care and preserving the health of cattle every day. Healthy cattle are the key to safe and wholesome beef. As a vet, I work hard to look out for the well-being of the cattle, no matter the time of day, no matter the weather. I'm here for the animals, and my work matters when it comes to the safety of the beef Americans eat. I'm proud of what we'll do here today. Welcome back. Are you interested in a 2011 John Deere Gator? Well, owning one might be easier than you think. Here in the studio to talk about an exciting promotion going on with John Deere is Marvin Kokash, Vice President of Association Marketing for NCBA. Marvin, thanks for coming back to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Kevin. Well, tell us just a little bit about this promotion to begin with. Well, uh, we have a partnership with John Deere. We offer uh, several uh, discounts and things. And part of our agreement with John Deere is they, they want to support the association. And they, uh, they give us a couple of uh, gators to fundraise with. And so uh, that's what we're doing uh, right now is on two 825i uh, John Deere Gators. And it's their new model. They are a little faster and uh, a little funner and better two workhorses for, uh, 
for these cattle operations. And I understand you're doing some sort of auction. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, actually that's how you, uh, you bid on the Gators is you uh, go online to beefusa.org and uh, it's right on the front page and you click on uh, the picture of the Gator. It'll give you the specifications and um, you're, it, it's very simple and you, you bid. It's kind of like a sealed, uh, sealed bid type of auction and uh, then the, we'll notify the winners. And when exactly does the auction end then? Well, it's actually going on right now and okay. we're going through uh, the, we need to have your bid by the close of business on August 23rd and uh, at 5 p.m. Mountain Time and we'll select the winners at that time and let them know right away so they can look forward to getting their gator on their operation. That sounds like a great deal. Now, exactly where do you all use the money for, uh, for the, that's generated by these gators? Sure. Um, the 100 percent of the proceeds for this auction go right to support our efforts in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've got a lot of political battles we're fighting right now, and we really uh, you know, need the additional resources. So that's why we encourage everyone to bid high, because it's going to a great place. Well, it sounds like a, a, a great item to be bidding on and something that's useful to a lot of us uh, on the ranch. Thank you so much, Marvin. All right. Thank you, Kevin. To place your bid on the 2011 John Deere Gator, visit the new and improved BeefUSA.org. Now, all the proceeds will support NCBA's work on Capitol Hill. Thanks for joining us for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD-TV.